regular Friday program of the City Club of Portland. I'm Mary Kramer, president of the club. We have a couple of new members in our audience today. As I call their names, I'd like for them to stand and then we'll give them a round of applause. First of all, we have Claudette Lavert Collier, personnel analyst for the City of Portland. Next, Elizabeth Scovran, physician. Please join me in welcoming our new members. We'd like to thank City Club members Mel Gertov and Gail E.W. Johnson for helping these members find us. Several announcements. On Wednesday, April 3rd, we have an open forum entitled Helping Children Learn, Fresh Perspectives from Business and Individuals. This open forum is sponsored by our Education Standing Committee and features individuals who are involved in Portland Public Schools volunteers. Speakers are Nancy Stanley, Division Manager, Nationwide Insurance, Harold Hart, Attorney and Instructor at Portland Community College, Leonard Gerard, Senior Vice President, Corporate Counsel and Secretary for Portland General Corporation, Pamela Jacklin, an attorney with Stowe, Reeves, Boley, Jones and Gray, and Kenneth Lewis, President, Lasco Shipping Company. This open forum will be from 5.30 to 7.30 p.m., excuse me, 5.30 to 7 p.m. at U.S. Bank Corp Tower, 26th floor, conference rooms B and C. It's free and open to the public. Then on Thursday, April 4th, we have another open forum. This one's entitled, What Services Are Left for What Citizens After Measure 5? This one is sponsored by our Human Services Standing Committee and is the third in a series presented on Measure 5, Boone or Bust. Speakers for this one are David Fuchs, Administrator, Metro Region of Children's Services Division, Mary Yeager, Vice President, Mount St. Joseph Extended Care Center, Marilyn Miller, Executive Director of Portland Impact, and Dwayne Zussi, Administrator, Department of Human Services, Multnomah County. This forum will be also from 5.30 to 7 p.m. at Two World Trade Center, mezzanine level, rooms two, three, and four. It's free and open to the public. Then, next Friday is a packed day, beginning in the morning at uh, 7 o'clock, we have a science breakfast on NOAA's scientific mission in the coming area, era. Excuse me. This features Sylvia Earle, who is chief scientist for the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. She's an internationally known marine scientist who has set deep sea diving records early in her career. She has her own special title, Her Royal Deepness. <laughs> Dr. Earl recently worked with a team of oceanographers and biologists who mapped the underwater contours and the ecology of Crater Lake. This program is co-sponsored by our Science and High Tech Standing Committee and the Institute for Science and Engineering and Public Policy at Portland State University. It is open to the public. Breakfast will be served at 7 a.m. with the program beginning at 7.30. Breakfast is $9. If you want just coffee, it's $2.50. There will be open seating at the back of the room. It will be at U.S. Bank Corp Tower at Waters Restaurant, 30th floor. Reservations are required and may be made via your handy dandy fax machine. 224-8499. You must reserve by Thursday, the 4th of April at 5 p.m. Then for our noon regular meeting, we will have Major General Frank Willis. He is filling in for General H.T. Johnson. Major General Willis is Deputy Chief of Staff for Requirements Headquarters Military Airlift Command, Scott Air Force Base, Illinois. 
He will be talking about taking the desert by storm, challenges in the Gulf War. We will be at U.S. Bank Corp Tower, 41st floor. Please remember, it's a change for us. Next week at the Bank Corp Tower. City Club is assisting the governor's office by helping uh, announce some of the appointments that are available. City Club member Phyllis Oster is heading the governor's office of executive appointments and they're looking for a wide variety of people to help the state do its business. So if you're interested, please keep reading your bulletin because we announce from time to time openings that are available. At the current time, we have openings for the Governor's Council on Alcohol and Drug Abuse Programs, the Children and Youth Services Commission, the Advisory Council on Podiatry, there are also applications at City Calls Club's office, so you can call our executive director, Nancy Hadeen, or you could call Phyllis Oster in Salem at 378-3123 to get applications. We will be publicizing more upcoming vacancies. City Club's leadership course, Pathways to Leadership, has been rescheduled to begin May 2nd, and that is an all-day session. Then there are four follow-up sessions every two weeks, meeting from May 23rd to June 13th. We still have eight slots available, so if you're interested, please give Nancy Hadeen, our executive director, a call as soon as possible. That's at City Club's office. Today, our board host is Chuck Williams, seated at my far left. He's a member of the Board of Governors and Media Relations Officer for Good Samaritan Hospital. He will have the privilege of asking the first question. The second question today will be asked by Teresa Lukowski clark of the Government and Taxation Standing Committee. After that, we will open to City Club members' questions. There will be a microphone on the floor. We do limit that. It is a privilege of membership, so only club members are allowed to ask questions. You may want to write out a question. There are blanks on the tables if you would like to write a question. If so, hold it up and staff members will pick it up. Please remember to ask a question and not make a statement. Now for today's program. As we live through this information age, our curiosity and our need to know only seems to increase. We answer questionnaires, respond to tele telephone surveys, participate in focus groups, offering our opinions about Brand X, the way it ought to be, or who we will vote for if we were to vote today. We're fascinated with the results. Public opinion is powerful. Brand X may go off the market to be replaced by new, improved Brand Z. Public policy may be shaped on the basis of the will of the people and political candidates may redesign their campaigns. Today we're going to hear from two well-known Oregon pollsters, Tim Hibbets and Bob Moore. Mr. Hibbets has a, excuse me, a Pacific Northwest data bank reaching back 16 years. His firm, TH Research, has worked with corporate corporations like Weyerhaeuser, media organizations like KATU and the Oregonian, and political candidates like Governors Neil Goldschmidt and Barbara Roberts. Bob Moore founded More Information 10 years ago after several years as executive director of the National Republican Senatorial Committee. His firm has worked with politicians like Senator Packwood and Senator Hatfield, industry like Boise Cascade, the Washington Forest Protection Association, and Public Service Corporation of New Mexico. Since our curiosity is whetted about what's going on in the state, as well as who might be our next mayor, please join me in welcoming our pollsters. Tim and I are gonna split this thing up today, and I'm gonna talk for five, and he's gonna talk for five, and. I'm going to come back and talk for five more minutes, and then he's going to have five more minutes. And the first thing we're going to cover is 
our outlook on what's going on nationally. And then we're going to come back and take a look at the state. Well, nationally, since the war is over, uh, I've been reading a lot, and just, you get this feeling that the political pundits know exactly what's going to happen in the 1992 elections. Well, I'm not so sure. Let me read you some headlines I recently saw. Bush trails Cuomo and other Democrats in race for president. Voters favor Democrats for Congress. Saddam Hussein has the world's fourth largest army. Fiction? Well, certainly all three are fiction today, but less than five months ago, all three were true. In politics, I think it's important to remember it ain't over till the fat lady sings. And in 1992, the election is probably going to be even more so. I mean, what a difference a few months can make. Today, Bush leads Cuomo 74 to 17 percent. According to the LA Times poll, Republicans are favored over Democrats for Congress 36 to 29 percent. And Saddam Hussein's army, well, it's certainly not fourth largest anymore. I'm not sure where we'd put it. And looking at 1992, I think I'll skip over the presidency for a minute and take a look at Congress, because there's going to be a lot of action down there. With reapportionment and the fact that a lot of congressional incumbents can retire and take home their, personal cam their campaign funds for personal use, we could see as many as 120 open seats. Add on top of that the anti-incumbent sentiment that's sweeping the country you may see as many as a third of Congress turn over in 1992. In state legislatures, it may be even more turnover, with reapportionment and a lot of legislators moving up for Congress and other offices. Now, I think President Bush gets reelected regardless, barring a scandal or major catastrophe, even with Dan Quayle on a ticket. Thanks to the war, I think he's been able to shed his wimp image forever. I think the question is we're looking at now is not will he win or not, but what impact will he have below the race for president? In three of the last four years in which the president ran in the same year as reapportionment occurred, the partisan control of Congress has changed. Nixon was the, sec was the only exception to that in the second time he ran. We all know about Nixon. The president will have more impact on open seats for Congress and the U.S. Senate than he will if there's a bunch of incumbents running. Because people running for open seats are less well known, and voters more likely to favor their favorite party when they don't know the candidates as well. But there's a few obstacles in George's way, of course. Things like deficit, taxes, savings and loan scandal, infrastructure problems, crime, health, to mention a few, that could dampen voter attitudes about his performance bring them down somewhat more from where they are today. I guess the thing we really need to know, will he be the kick butt, take, kind, take names kind of leader that we saw the last couple of months, or is he going to be the, have, offer the same half-baked, wimpy ideas that we saw last fall when we got into the discussion about taxes and the deficit? Whatever George Bush goes to the election in 1992 could have a great deal of impact on Congress and the state legislatures. But beyond Bush, if the Republicans are going to make any gains, they're going to have to have some good candidates for both the House and the Senate. And that's where Republicans have fallen down in elections recently. Generally speaking, they've been closer to the voters on issues in general. They do just as well as the Democrats on campaign technology. But when it comes to good candidates, Democrats have it all over them. The classic examples. In 1980, when Republicans won control of the US Senate, issues were the reason. In 1986, when Democrats won control of the Senate back again, they had the better candidates. In 1990, Republicans went out on a major recruitment binge for candidates recruiting for the United States Senate. And they had what they thought were the best crop of candidates ever, a lot of people from the House of Representatives. Unfortunately, with the anti-incumbent sentiment of the last election, those good quality candidates weren't able to capitalize on their good qualities. Because in the mind of the voters, a House incumbent is an incumbent whether he or she runs for the House or the Senate. In summary, for the national scene, as I said, Bush will be reelected in Congress, in the legislatures. Just remember, it ain't over until the fat lady sings, despite what the pundits say. Regardless, there's going to be a lot of new faces. 
And if Bush and the Republicans get it together, there could be a partisan shift in control in Congress and a lot of legislatures. If not, we're going to con see continued divided control with a Republican president, Democrat Congress. Now in Oregon, though, it's a whole different story. Tim? Thank you. Uh, just something to clarify that Mary said. Uh, my work for Governor Roberts was during the time that she was Secretary of State. I didn't have any role in the race last year, so I wanted to make sure uh, that was uh, clear. Um, I'm a little surprised to hear a re so-called Republican pollster calling the president half-baked. Um, <laughs> but uh, I know that was a few months ago and things have changed uh, since then. A couple of years ago, after the 1988 uh, presidential election, Bob and I spoke in front of the city club and focused on what we thought the election meant. And I spent most of my time talking about uh, the problems that the Democratic Party had on a national level. And I want to say that I generally subscribe to Bob's interpretation of the problems that the, Repub or that the Democrats are a superior party on a local level. They have control most of the governorships, most of the legislatures, most of the uh, congressional seats, obviously. Um, but um, my perception is that the Democrats nationally are a party that are, are very ill. Uh, and uh, I'm inclined to agree with Bob that it is likely that George Bush, strongly likely that George Bush is going to be reelected next year, and as of this point, strongly likely to, that he's going to be reelected by uh, potentially a very large margin. Uh, it may be that the Democrats will hold on to the District of Columbia uh, and perhaps another state or two, uh, but it doesn't look very good right now, and I think the quality of the candidates that they have surfacing is a clear indication that the so-called party leaders, uh, the ones who might pre present a more, more difficult challenge for George Bush, are running for the door. Uh, you know, the, the Democrats have kind of become the New Jersey Nets of presidential politics. Uh, and there are a number of reasons for that. The biggest one being, I think, that you've got a party pretty candidly that persists in nominating candidates that don't appeal to the mainstream of, of the American voter uh, or, or the American voters. In the last 20 years, the Democrats have offered us uh, George McGovern. Uh, Jimmy Carter twice, and in 1976, you can say, well, Jimmy Carter won, and we might remind ourselves that that was following Watergate, the pardon of Richard Nixon, and a very severe recession in 1975 and 1976. Jimmy Carter won by all of, I believe, one and a half percent, and I believe a switch of about 8,000 votes in two states would have made Gerald Ford president. Then they offered up Walter Mondale, I guess on the theory that a guy who'd helped as president carry six states. Uh, probably uh, would, would make a good presidential candidate. And then we got Michael Dukakis last time. Um, the, as I see the situation, the Democratic Party is in a position next year that if they put forth a weak candidate, and, and I think it's very possible you could see uh, a Songus or someone like that get the nomination who's going to have a lot of difficulty raising uh, a nat or running a national campaign, then I think you've got a potential nightmare scenario for the Democrats. And that scenario would be something like this. We wake up the morning after the election next year, and indeed George Bush has carried 47, 48, or 49 states, or 50 states. Again, I'm assuming the Democrats will hold on to the District of Columbia. Um, and a lot of Democrats on the right or, uh, look at each other, and a lot of Democrats on the left look at each other. And what you've got basically is a, is a balkanization of the party, where those Democrats who have been more in the, on the moderate or center right strain, and I'm referring to folks like Charles Robb uh, of Virginia, uh, Bill Graham or Bob Graham of Florida. Perhaps you could put Al Gore into that category. Uh, Senators Heflin and Richard Shelby of, of uh, Alabama may just decide that perhaps uh, the Democratic Party doesn't really have, uh, is not really a place for them to stay uh, over the long term. We've seen a couple of party switches, uh, or in particular the Buddy Romer switch, though there may be some other reasons for that. The governor of Louisiana recently switched from the Democrat to the Republican Party. I wouldn't be surprised if you began to see, if, again, this scenario plays out of the Democrats being clobbered again nationally, I wouldn't be surprised to begin to see a significant number of, of the more uh, conservative Democrats perhaps decide that, that they really don't have a home in the Democratic Party anymore. Uh, it may be, and I think, again, this is all a little bit 
premature, but it's worth thinking about because I think it's much more likely the Democrats are going to be wiped out presidentially next year than they are going to present a serious challenge at this point. It may be a, a, legitimate, question to ask, a, a legitimate question to ask about whether or not the Democratic Party uh, has come to the end of its natural lifespan uh, in terms of, uh, of its ability to, to uh, present any kind of cohesive uh, uh, front or cohesive uh, program for the country. Now, a lot of folks would argue that George Bush doesn't have a cohesive uh, program either, and that may or may not be so, uh, but the Republicans are much better at appearances and making it look like uh, they have uh, uh, such a program. Uh, so I think that's something, something, something to think about for next time around. Tim, speaking as a Republican, I wish I was as pessimistic about the Democrats as you are. <laughs> The only thing I can say in response is uh, uh, look at the numbers, uh, uh, look, at the, look at the results of the last ele several elections. Even when the Democrats have theoretically supposed to have been ahead with the caucus, they wind up getting wiped out. Certainly on the national level, but down yeah. at the Congress and, and, and Senate, yeah. it's a whole different yeah. ballgame. I agree with that. One of my friends from Washington, D.C. Uh, asked me the other day how I would describe politics in Oregon, and I thought of that well-known phrase that I think sums it all up, things look different here. <laughs> And I thought I'd cite some examples. Right now we see in polls, at least since the war, that the public is very optimistic about the country. But if you ask voters in Oregon what they think about the state, they're very pessimistic. In fact, they're the most pessimistic they've been at any time since the fall of 1986. Now there's three reasons basically for the pessimism. One, of course, is fear of recession. Oh, I don't see that we've had it yet. There is a fear of that we might. Secondly, there's a lot of uncertainty out there about the impact of the property tax limitation. And lastly, there is no perceived leadership coming from the governor's office to solve problems that people think uh, facing the state right now. Now, this is in stark contrast to the numbers we saw in early 1987, where at that time the governor was perceived having answers to solve the problems, and the electorate was much more optimistic about the governor's chances to solve the problems. If we look at issues in the state, Jobs and the economy have become the major concern in the past couple of months. Concern about crime is down. Concern about protecting the environment is down, which means the spotted owl will now be less popular. The timber industry image is up, which is typical during periods of when people are concerned about the economy. If you work in the timber business right now, I'd start getting your messages out to the folks because they're going to be very receptive to your message when the economy is not as in good shape. Concern about growth is down. Last summer, concern about growth had got to the point where in Washington County it was the number one issue. <clears throat> Beyond issues, there's a concern out there that government at all levels is not working, either federal, state, or local. And basically, this fuels the anti-incumbency mood. And we ask a question about limiting the terms of state legislators in November in a poll we did, we found that it was favored 70 to 20 percent. Campaign reform is also very popular, especially measures to limit the amount of contribution you can give to candidates. And increasing taxes is not popular at all, less so in fact than it was last fall or summer, although voters believe that eventually we'll need a replacement for the revenues lost from the property tax limitation. Now, look at, looking at the 1992 elections in Oregon, again, keeping in mind that things look different here, we've got elections for U.S. Senate, Congress, statewide level below governor, and of course the legislature. I think Bob Packwood will probably be reelected, and probably all five congressional incumbents will be as well, although any of them could be vulnerable to a significant candidate due just to the fact that people are tired of incumbents. That alone is enough to make any one of our incumbent office holders vulnerable in 1992. I don't expect any of the incumbent congressmen to run against Senator Packwood. They have no advantage as they are an incumbent just as he is an incumbent. The legislature is certainly a wild card. I think we need probably to wait till a German, at least I would, before I would make any predictions about the outcome of that. But one thing that might we might see a little bit differently if the perceptions that there is no leadership coming from the governor's office continue, the legislature might assume a higher profile in the mind of voters and accordingly be given credit or assigned responsibility for whatever the problems are. As far as a sales tax, 
<clears throat> well, if the public perceived that government spending had been cut and that property taxes were down, I think it might have a chance of passage in 1992. It's certainly the most popular option for replacement revenue, but that's due in large part to the fact that voters are most, most familiar with it as opposed to other possible options. At this point in time, I have to say there is certainly no strong sentiment for a sales tax. And my guess is today or even this year, there'd be no chance of passage. Closer to home in the mayor's race here, um, my guess is that Vera Katz beats Earl Blumenauer, unless Mike Shrunk runs. Um, a lot of water yet will run under that bridge, of course. Vera Katz has never been tested in a high profile race but when Earl Blumenauer was last tested, he was defeated by Margaret Strawn. But I think it's safe to say, regardless of who we get for mayor, that they're gonna have more political experience than, than Mayor Clark did when he was first elected. <clears throat> so, for my summary about Oregon, again, things look different here. Mood-wise, we're confident about the country, we're pessimistic about the state. Last fall, we increased federal taxes, but we reduced property taxes in Oregon. In Congress, there's going to be a lot of new faces nationally, but I don't expect very many new faces in Oregon. And finally, in the race for mayor, while the trend nationwide will be for new faces, it looks like we're going to get an old experienced hand. Bob has uh, stolen most of what I wanted to say, uh, but it's, uh, it must be because we're looking at the same sets of poll numbers. Uh, you know, there's an int what's happened on the issue front or the issue agenda in this state in the last decade, decade has been looking like a roller coaster. The first half of the 1980s, when we were in a serious recession in this state, every poll we took in virtually every area, the number one issue, in fact, almost the only issue, were concerns over the economy. By the mid-80s, 86 in particular, as the economy began to improve, the issue agenda shifted dramatically, uh, and the number one issue on a statewide basis and an overwhelming number one issue in the tri-county area became the issue of crime. That ran from about 1987 to 1989. In, 1980, in 1990, we found crime began to slip, and what came up were issues about forest, forest issues, the spotted owl, the old growth issue, how much to cut, what not to cut. Uh, now in 1991, we find that the number one issue as at this point is what is the impact of Measure 5 and what should be done about it. Uh, now let me add that that spans a wide number of, of concerns. Some people say the response to Measure 5 should be simply to cut, cut more. Other people say we need a sales tax. Still others say Measure 5 shouldn't have been passed in the first place. So there are a whole variety of folks who have a different set of opinions as to what ought to be done. Uh, but when you total them all up, that to me, from what I see, is far and away the, the, the issue that is generating the most heat at this point. I think the economy is number two, and it's increased considerably since last year. And if we go into a serious recession in this state, I would suspect it would, it would become the top issue. Um, I agree with Bob completely on the interpretation that we have an anti-incumbent or a surly electorate out there. Uh, and maybe they have good reason to be uh, uh, surly. Uh, a lot of folks looked very superficially at the results from last year's election, where in Oregon, for example, most incumbents were returned, with the exception of uh, uh, Denny Smith, uh, who really kind of killed himself uh, more than anything else by running the, the Saddam Hussein ads, uh, is suggesting that his opponent was soft on, on Saddam Hussein. Um, but if you look behind those numbers, you'll see that, that people who ran, such as Congressman Acoin, a longtime incumbent, really had no serious opposition, yet his numbers were down about eight or nine points from where they were in 1988. This was a pattern that happened across the country. In Washington state, uh, for example, every incumbent congressman's numbers were down substantially with one exception, and that was Jolene Unsold, who had a, a tough race in her district, that uh, portion of which is across the river, and she decided to go negative on her opponent uh, three months before the election, and I think very effectively uh, defined him to such a way that people may have decided they preferred the devil they did know to the devil they didn't. Um, the other 
uh, point I would make there is uh, very much in Bob's line is that I think that this redistricting and changes uh, that are going to occur in retirements are going to create more intense interest in congressional races. And I, I think there may be some surprises in Oregon next year. I'm not sure exactly where they're going to be at this point, uh, but I think that uh, it's very possible that one of the incumbents may wind up getting into a lot of trouble and, and losing. Uh, I think that the, the person at the top of that list is probably Senator Packwood, and he's got a lot of problems. Uh, he's got a problem with the right wing of his own party. He's obviously going to try to uh, jerry uh, build a bridge across to those folks, but uh, that may prove to be a fairly rickety structure. Uh, he uh, has uh, pr the problem of having been in office now for a long time uh, and, and at the same time has an anti-incumbent, I think, the trend is at this point on top of that. Um, he's uh, obviously has to have an opponent. You can't beat a horse with no horse. And if uh, the opponent uh, is someone uh, not particularly well known or not well funded, then I think that may effectively uh, return uh, Senator uh, uh, Packwood. Uh, on the local level, um, Vera Katz and Earl Blumenauer are certainly the top two candidates for mayor, uh, but I think there is a lot of opening there for other candidates if they can demonstrate uh, that they are credible, uh, uh, potentially credible mayors. Uh, I don't think you'll see an opening for the kind of uh, uh, out in from the hills guerrilla kind of attack that Bud Clark uh, did in 1984 to take uh, Frank Ivancy out. I don't think we'll see another mayor elected uh, with a, uh, a paucity of, of local government experience. I think they will vote for an experienced hand, but at the same time that may be a new face. If I was handicapping right now, I, I wouldn't fundamentally disagree with Bob. I suspect that uh, if I were to put the pecking order, I would, I would put Katz slightly above Blumenauer, but I think it's a very, very close uh, race at this point, and I think each of the candidates brings particular strengths uh, in, uh, and I think each of the candidates will have questions that will need to be answered about their abilities to withstand a long campaign. Uh, for Vera Katz, she's never been in a long campaign or a serious campaign. Uh, as Bob pointed out, Commissioner Blumenauer lost the uh, one tough contested race that he was in, but he also has a history of organizing early for races and raising a significant chunk of money, and such as in 1986 and 1990, scaring uh, other potential candidates out of the race. I don't think you'll be able to do that this time, but I think that organization and money are certainly going to count for a fair amount in this kind of a race. Thank you. Chuck Williams, member of the Board of Governors, will ask the first question, Chuck. Thank you, Mary. Um, I can't believe what these guys are saying about each other's parties. Are you sure you sat them in the correct chair, Mary? Maybe you should have them change seats here. Uh, my question could go to either of the gentlemen, uh, but uh, perhaps more to Bob. I think back over the last, um, oh, the passing yesterday of Lee Atwater, and uh, who probably holds uh, two very significant legacies. One, his rock and roll playing, and but secondly, what most of us remember is the uh, Willie Horton ad. And I'm wondering if you feel that this type of very negative campaigning um, will be the norm in the upcoming elections. I think uh, there's a lot of feeling that this type of uh, quote unquote dirty campaigning was what turned a lot of people off and perhaps uh, contributed to the anti-incumbent uh, sentiment by, uh, by voters. Could either or both of you um, respond to what you think we'll see, especially in the next national election? I don't think the uh, uh, attack campaigns have anything to do with opposition to incumbency. Uh, that's primarily a function of perceptions that the system isn't working. And that is, you see that most prominently at the national level, you see it also very prominently in the bigger states. For example, in California, people are much more cynical about the system and the government than they are in Oregon or in Idaho or other smaller states. We're catching up fast, though. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think if you say are candidates going to talk about their opposition's records in the future, I think they are going to do that. Um, I saw a very interesting twist on that in this past election. Larry Pressler in South Dakota uh, set up a pledge for all candidates to sign 
in which they would not ta attack each other unless they did it in person. You couldn't have another, you couldn't have an announcer attack your opposition. If you wanted to say something about your opposition or attack his record, you had to do it yourself, which I thought was kind of an innovative twist on the whole idea. But um, doing that kind of thing would make each candidate think a lot before they blasted the opposition. Uh, I'd address that for a minute, uh, Chuck, and say that I suspect that the campaigns, uh, I don't hold out a great deal of hope they're going to get much better uh, in the next few years. Uh, the trend has been progressively downward uh, across the country, uh, and I think that uh, unfortunately it, uh, that kind of campaigning has come to Oregon, and I think it's going to uh, continue uh, and probably get worse. I would say there is a legitimate difference between uh, attacking your opponent is, is legitimate, uh, but the way in which it's being done uh, and practiced by partisans of both sides across the country, uh, I'm afraid it is getting out of hand. The other observation I'd make, which, which uh, is only a, a very subjective one, is, you know, it seems that less and less voters are cynical and they believe politicians can't really do or are not doing anything or very little to solve the problems we have in the country. And uh, it may be that the politicians themselves, uh, uh, if they cannot argue about issues, have decided that if they really can't do anything about the issues, no matter who's elected, they may as well sully the other guy's reputation. Uh, and if that's the way to get in, that's, that's a reasonable way to do it. Teresa Lukowski Clark has the privilege of the second question from the Government and Taxation Standing Committee. Teresa? Um, often polling results are viewed with skepticism. Can you tell me if there's any self-regulation in the industry to guarantee the results of the polls that you often, um, the numbers that you release? I'd like to know if there is self-regulation even. Well, I think there's a self-regulation to the extent that any uh, there is a national governing board called the National Council on Public Polls, but that is only, uh, uh, that's limited to polls that are released publicly, that ABC News might do, or that NBC oh. might do, or that the Oregonian might do, and that is that you're supposed to lay out the questions that have been asked, the way in which they've been asked, the sample size, and, and the times and dates that the poll was conducted. On a, on a basis when I think probably 95 to 99 percent of the polling that Bob and I and most pollsters do never sees the light of the day in terms of the public. Um, the self-regulation is we have an interest in getting accurate data to our client, and I think that's true of any polling firm in this state or, or around the country. To the, uh, we want to make sure that what we do is a, is a good uh, poll, that it accurately reflects the makeup of, say, the, the geographic or the demographic area that we're in. If we were to go to uh, Multnomah County and do a survey of Multnomah County and wound up with twice as many Republicans in that poll as Democrats, we would know that we had done something wrong uh, because there are, in fact, about twice as many Democrats as Republicans. So there are all kinds of checks that you look at to make sure, as best you can, that your, that your poll is a reasonably accurate reflection of what the, the demographics of that particular area look like. I just say that 99 and 90 0.9% of the polls you all see in the newspapers or television are public polls, exclusively designed for the public. The kind of stuff that Tim and I do are, is privately held information, and if we're wrong, we're not working for our clients anymore. I mean, the market is going to kick us out quicker than any kind of regulation. Thank you. Herb? I'm Herb Crane, a member. My question would welcome an answer from each of you. But Mr. Hibbets indicated that if Packwood were to be faced with a credible opponent who was reasonably well known, he might have serious trouble. I would ask each of you, would you consider Harry Lonsdale such an opponent? <laughs> I would consider him uh, uh, yes, I would consider him a, an opponent. Um, I think, though, I think he's damaged goods, frankly. Uh, he blew his wad on the Hatfield campaign. I don't think that he would be uh, viewed nearly as credible the next time around as he was in this past campaign. I wouldn't have any fundamental disagreement with that. I think he would be a credible opponent, but I think that he is damaged goods. And I also wonder, you know, when Mark Hatfield's campaign team went after Harry Lonsdale, it did not take them very long to open up the wounds. Uh, and I have, in the, in the sense of, of finding some problems in Mr. Lonsdale's past, the Rajneesh letter, that we're going to cause him a lot of trouble. Bob Packwood is uh, a consummate 
uh, political tactician. And I would suspect that were Mr. Lonsdale to enter the race uh, for uh, his seat and become Packwood's opponent, that it would not take very long before the, the uh, uh, Oregon voters would be seeing red. <laughs> I just say, you, you're going to have a whole different campaign with Bob Packwood running in the election than you did with Mark Hatfield. Uh, Packwood is, Tim said, is a consummate politician planning every minute for the campaign, while well, Senator Hatfield decided to work on a campaign in October of last year. Barbara Clark, City Club uh, member, with a question for Mr. Moore. Uh, your firm was criticized for uh, using a poll on the telephone to disseminate disparaging information about the opposing candidate rather than merely gathering information. What kind of standards do you follow? Where, where you think the line should be drawn? Well, again, the market will regulate, but that was purely a, politi a partisan political charge. We were conducting interviews of people and doing what is standardly accepted questions in our business. And the candidate that, that, uh, with, that made the charge didn't happen to like his record that we were asking people about. And so basically charge made the charge. Um, if we don't get accurate information for our client, it's not worth anything to our client. If somebody wants to disseminate information, there are firms that for a lot less money you can call to go out and disseminate information. If you want to go out and tell some candidate voted some way on a particular issue, you can go out and spend 60 cents a call and let voters know that. Instead of charging, we charge $15 a call to find out the information. So, you know, it's purely a ludicrous charge. Uh, a follow-up question. Uh, in this community, word of mouth is really powerful still. I don't know how big we have to be before it won't be. And what if you, what if you, what if one actually disseminated false information while conducting a poll? What would you think of that? Well, I mean, I would think it was the wrong thing to do. But again, um, and, and no one in our business is knowingly going to disseminate false information uh, about another candidate because it does our client no good to find out what the voters think about false information. Our client wants to know, you know, what people think about himself or herself and what they think about the opposition. Uh, that's what you hire a pollster for at 15 or 25 or $30 an interview. You don't hire a pollster to sit at that kind of price to disseminate false information. If you want to, as I say, if you want to get false information out, there's a lot cheaper way to do it, let me tell you. Next question, please. Jim Westwood, City Club member. I'd like to ask both of, the, uh, both of you gentlemen if you could comment on what your uh, polling results show about what seems to be a rift in the Republican Party in Oregon with a, uh, a group of <coughs> people perceived as being on the right, and I take it mainly Republican, are showing some real power at the ballot box. Uh, if that's true, is that a long-standing trend that's going to continue, or is it going to be a flash in the pan? Well, I think there is some rift in the Republican Party. Uh, but I would say that I think the fractures in the Republican Party, even though they were very damaging to Dave Frohnmeyer, the fractures in the Republican Party, at least nationally, are really a lot less, uh, they're, they're much smaller than the fractures, I think, that, that, than you've got in the Democratic Party. There's no question that, that uh, the right wing of the Republican Party has a certain amount of impact uh, uh, on politics in this state. Uh, but all they've shown is that they can defeat they can defeat other Republican candidates who are more mainstream, and that they can get maybe 12 or 13 percent of the vote on a statewide basis. Uh, they will lose uh, the Mobley faction will lose every election they contest uh, in this state, and probably in virtually any community in the state. So their power is an, is a negative power. It, it, it's 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 there, but it's a negative power. They're not r really going to, to to elect anyone to anything. I think it's part of the natural ebb and flow of politics as well. Uh, you'll see from time to time, third-party splinter groups from the left and the right come up to some prominence. And as Tim mentioned, basically all they're ever able to do is defeat people of the party that they're closest to. But I wouldn't look at this as any long-term trend. Bob McMenamin, member. It is my understanding that the Judicial uh, Department of Government only spends about one-half of one percent of the budget but that it uh, supposedly has equal power to the other two departments. 
I'd like comments from both of you as to whether or not you feel that any forthcoming decisions from our U.S. Supreme Court might hurt or help either party in power or to gain power. That's coming up. Well, <laughs> what's on the list? I yeah, guess. what's on the list? <laughs> well, you, you have a number like uh, abortion is back on the list. Uh, um, oh, golly, there's so many of them. Reapportionment, I think, is also on the list. Uh, uh, taxation is always on the list. Uh, taxation of nonprofit, uh, things of that sort. Um, uh, funding of uh, politicians is on the list. It's almost ad infinitum. Almost every uh, thing that you can think of in the political scene is going to show up. The, as you know, the court puts out about 140 decisions per year, and uh, most of them uh, would affect the entire electorate. I don't know, like, occasionally it might have some impact. I can remember people running against the Earl Warren court 20 years ago. Um, whether it did them any good, I don't recall any examples of people getting elected because they were, you know, ran a campaign against Earl Warren in, in the Supreme Court. Uh, it may offer some opportunities. In one sense, the court's always a bogeyman where you can blame your own problems on somebody else. The court is as good as anybody else, I guess. But I can't think of anything specific, any specific harm that they would do to either side. Well, the, the, I would agree with one possible exception, and that's the abortion uh, issue. The, the, every poll that I've seen on, a, on any level shows that uh, while voters are, uh, uh, have some moral qualms about abortion, uh, the large percentage in this state and from most states and nationally uh, of voters want that decision to be left to the individual or to the, in to the individual woman and her doctor. Uh, it would seem there might be some problem if a Republican court or a court appointed by fundamentally Ronald Reagan overturned uh, Roe v. Webster, uh, the Democrats might have an issue uh, to make out of that. Um, so in that respect, uh, you, might, you might see something, but the, the other things, I, I just don't think so. Ross Hall, City Club member. I'd like to come back to your comments about uh, public polls versus your private polls. Could you both comment about the use of public polls as printed in the Oregonian and elsewhere in the outcome of elections? Have you used them? Are they effective? And can they change the direction of an election? Um, There's been an increasing use of public polls by the media. I think in 1984, there were 38 uh, public polls done by media on the presidential race, and in 1988, there were 140. Um, the problem with, that I see and with so many media uh, polls, and, and the public polls basically is what we're talking about here, is uh, they're often used to create a story Everybody wants a, you know, a poll is always a good story. So uh, nothing else going on on Tuesday. Let's do a poll. That way we got something we can write about. Um, also, in the hands of non-qualified people, which oftentimes media uh, polls end up, they give them to the writer and say, here's the numbers. You write the article. Uh, you often get a story that is not totally accurate or doesn't really reflect what the poll says. Um, I guess it is somewhat disturbing to me because it does, uh, I think it detracts from the issues of the campaign. Um, if every day you've got a new poll result to talk about in your article or on television or on radio, basically you're not talking about what candidate X said or what candidate Y said or what they replied. You're not, you're, the attention is taken away from the real, you know, what the campaign is going to do for the country or for the state. And I think in that regard, it's, uh, in the increasing public polls, especially by the media, are potentially harmful. I would have a, a, a pretty different point of view on that, but I'd also state that my company conducted polling for, for Channel 2 last year in the election cycle. Uh, but I would, I would say that uh, a poll uh, can occasionally impact the course of a campaign, and I suspect one example of that was when the uh, Oregonian poll came out uh, on the 1st of October last year showing that uh, uh, Senator Hatfield's 36-point lead was now a six-point lead and shrinking quickly. My guess is that that probably charged 
the Hatfield people with a sense of urgency uh, that they didn't appear to have had uh, at any point in the, the previous year. Uh, and, and I think that's, that's fairly newsworthy. I think the other interesting thing is it may very well have impacted the election uh, because I wonder, my understanding was Senator Hatfield was doing little or no polling up to that point and was looking at the 36 point lead and assuming that he had re-election in the bag. Well, a lot of other private pollsters and uh, myself, but others who were even close, more closely attuned to the race, including Lonsdale's pollster, knew that thing was closing up very, very rapidly. So what would have happened if, had there been no public polls? Uh, probably Harry Lonsdale would be, uh, a, 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 there's certainly more likelihood he would have been a senator. Uh, the observation where I might disagree with Bob as well is that I think that it's kind of a, a red herring to say that uh, if the no, no news media publishes polls that that uh, means that we're not going to be talking about the issues. Well, I think political candidates in this country of the left and right and Democrats and Republicans have both shown for many years that they're quite capable of dodging the issues uh, in a campaign <laughs> without the benefit of any poll to smokescreen for them. Tim. Let me uh, argue with you on two points. <laughs> First now of all, some controversy. the day before the Oregonian ca poll came out on Senator Hatfield, our poll, we had a poll to him that was more up to date than the Oregonian poll that had him seven points behind. So while in terms of the general public, there was the view that the Oregonian kicked him in the rear, basically he'd been kicked in the rear the day before and we were off on the road and so you know that it would not have had any impact in the Senate race. Uh, with regard to the other thing, I don't buy for a minute that the American public reads a poll and makes decisions. I mean, the American, I'm, if anything, being in this business 10 years has taught me a lot about the integrity and the knowledge and uh, the responsibility which people hold, you know, in their vote. And so for a minute, I'm not suggesting that any poll influences a voter, but I do suggest that polls do influence media coverage. And just because for the fact that it's an attractive thing to write about, and you know we're constantly hearing nobody's talking about the issues. Well, you know, if you read the newspapers and the television about the presidential campaigns, you're right. You don't see anything about the issues because they're covering you know some scandal, some little you know story that has no bearing, but is you know of national interest according to the news media. And you've got these guys out on the stump talking about things, and you don't hear about their views of crime, education, everything else going on because there are more interesting things for news editors to cover. Bill Lash, member. I'd like to uh, reflect a little bit, have each of you reflect, if you would, on your comments about anti-incumbency. Uh, my memory is not as good as it used to be, but I do seem to recollect back last fall a great deal of discussion about how many incumbents were likely to be thrown out, that the polls were showing the voters were extremely uneasy about the incumbents and that there could be a lot of change, and yet the election came and went and we had, what, 98 percent or some higher percentage re-elected. Uh, are you now telling us that that, based on, say, Les Coin's winning margin going from 80-20 to 70-30, that suddenly we are going to start throwing some of these people out? Uh, is there been some basic change or, or are the voters, out of curiosity, telling the pollsters one thing a week before the election or a month before, walking in and doing something different? Bill, again, I'd, I'd fall back on you can't beat a horse with no horse. Um, one of the problems for challengers last year was that some of this mood began to develop as 1990 rolled on, and it particularly snowballed in the polling that we saw as you got into September and the budget, if you remember the budget hearings, every night uh, you would see the, the lead story on the television was Congress had screwed up today uh, because they had not passed a budget or they passed a two-day continuing budget. That really seemed to exacerbate the unease that was already out there. But the problem was in most districts in the country, whoever was the incumbent didn't have a serious challenger. And so you, the public would have to be in a revolutionary mood to throw out less a coin and replace them with Earl Molander when a coin has I don't know how many thousands of dollars to spend and only 17 percent of the voters probably know who Earl Molander is. Uh, at that, Molander got 33 or 32 percent or a percentage of the vote in the 30s, which I suspect is a much larger percentage of voters that, than could name who, who uh, Lesa Coyne's opponent was. So what I'm trying to say is, to some degree, one of the reasons you didn't have more of a turnover was is that you didn't have the, the, the candidates in place to take advantage of that. If, you had if both parties had recruited stronger candidates in 1990, for 1990 with more money and they had been able to capitalize at maximum on the anti-incumbency that was there, I think you would have seen much, much more turnover. I agree with Tim. I think another thing that 
you look at Oregon's filing day for election in March of 90, you know, nobody was talking about anti-incumbent mood in March of 90, so, you know, it was too late in most cases to get, you know, find some good quality candidate to run against Lessa Coyne. It might be different in 1992. Last question, Clyde. Uh, Clyde Doctor, City Club member. Uh, funny thing happened to me shortly before the last election. I uh, got a phone call about a, about a week before the election from a person that uh, uh, alleged to be working for a pollster. Um, wanted to ask some questions about one of the ballot measures and uh, asked a series of questions, many of which began with the phrase, uh, would you change your mind if? Um, the person obviously was not skilled in, as a pollster, and I know that you're always very careful to train your people to ask questions fluently. Um, it happened to be a ballot measure that I had some familiarity with, and, and I knew that many of the alleged facts that might change my mind were incorrect. The thing that was really interesting is 10 minutes later, I got the same call again different pollster this time. Now, isn't that quite a coincidence that uh, I would be selected twice by your random uh, sampling technique? Honor. <laughs> um, that is a coincidence. <laughs> it wasn't my firm, as you know, Clyde. We weren't, we weren't doing any campaigns uh, last year. So. There are a lot of companies, I say, that do what, what do they call that? Uh, voter persuasion calls. That's part of their bit, telemarketing, voter persuasion calls. And you can hire a company if you want to get a message out to somebody that will do that for you. Any last comments? You're happy. <laughs> okay, please join me in thanking our guests.